good evening and good afternoon to everyone. I think we're all on several different time zones, but um, I appreciate everybody being able to log in and make it here. On my screen, Dr. Paul, can you see all these videos on the right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let, me, let me minimize this. That way you can see. I could see wound care management. All right, you can see the whole thing. So yeah, let's, let's jump into this. Um, like Dr. Uh, Paul said, I'm gonna be speaking on wound care and management. Um, so right off the bat, I think it's good to um, just kind of understand the phases of wound healing. And the first phase that we typically are going to see is inflammatory and the hemostasis phase. And essentially what's happening is once you have an injury to the skin or to the tissues, you're going to have platelets starting to uh, conjugate to that area. We're going to have our blood vessels. They're going to start constricting down uh, to minimize blood flow there. We're going to then, uh, like I said, have those platelets coming in and then we're going to start having a clot formation. Now, once the bleeding has stopped, the body is going to start uh, opening up those blood vessels, which is going to allow for immune cells to start coming in. Uh, and once those vessels start opening up, they're also going to become much more permeable. Uh, again, we're going to have neutrophils and macrophages, and this is when you're going to start seeing the, the red of the tissue on the surrounding. You're going to see start seeing some edema uh, collecting in that area. And kind of at the same time, um, that this is happening, our second phase, which is our debridement phase, is also starting to occur. And what we're seeing is we're going to have these neutrophils that are going to flux in to this area um, to start attacking the bacteria that's present. Uh, and followed by those neutrophils, we're going to start having monocytes and leukocytes, as well as other white blood cells uh, rushing to this area. These cells are going to release different cytokines and growth factors to start promote healing, uh, to start killing bacteria and phagocytizing those bacteria, and then removing and debriding and, and getting rid of all this cellular debris after the neutrophils start rupturing, the macrophages kind of come in and help clear things up. And most of the second phase, the neutrophils are gonna be um, peaked at about three days uh, and that's when you're going to start seeing a much higher rate of macrophages in that area. So with our third phase of healing, this is when we're going to have like a proliferative or repair phase. And this is when our fibroblasts are going to start um, proliferating. We're going to get angiogenesis, which is when we're having more blood vessels develop in this area, as well as collagen synthesis. And this is when you're going to get your nice bright pink granulation tissue. And along with that bright pink granulation tissue, we're going to start having uh, the edges of the wounds are going to slowly start contracting down. We're going to get some new skin growth over the top, trying to close up this defect. And this typically is going to start on day four, five, and it's going to continue for about a month. And I'm getting a little bit of background. Are y'all hearing that background? Maybe somebody can mute their, uh, mute their mic. Background is okay for us, it's okay. Okay, okay, good. All right. So, um, after the, the fourth phase, <coughs> excuse me, after the third phase, we get our, our fourth and final stage, which is when we're gonna have, basically at this point, the granulation tissue and the skin has come back together. And so we no longer have that defect and what we have here uh, is wound contraction um, over a long period of time. I mean, this can be, you know, from day 20 to day 30. So after the first month or so, uh, and this can happen for years and years and years, is that these, this scar is going to kind of remodel and um, contract. I think it's good to know that anytime you have a scar, especially a large scar, that strength of that scar is only going to be about 70 to 80 percent of any other surrounding tissue. Um, just to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and so after the, another thing I think that is nice to kind of be aware of or kind of keep in the back of your mind are the different closures. And so we have primary, secondary, and tertiary. And this is more nomenclature, more just kind of background. But, um, you know, primary closure is when you have wound edges that are pretty much opposed or very close to one another. 
um, and they can typically be closed with either suture, staple, or glue. Um, there's a low fish, low risk for infection, and so the most common or most common example is some kind of a surgical incision for like, let's say for a spay or for a neuter. And then we, at the end of that procedure, we suture that back up because, you know, as long as we handle the tissues well in an aseptic manner, um, then there's low chance of that being infected. And so we can close that up normally. Um, what we're going to talk about a majority of today is a secondary closure, which is going to be a majority of your wounds. Um, and so a majority of your wounds are going to have a defect so big that you can't close the skin edges back together. And it's actually going to require granulation that like, again, that bright pink tissue to kind of fill in the, the defect there. Um, typically there's a greater risk of infection and it's going to take uh, longer than the primary closure. Um, just because we have to wait on that granulation tissue to fill the defect and then slowly uh, move its way up towards the uh, surface edge for the skin to kind of reconnect there. And the most common, again, this is gonna be any kind of traumatic laceration. It could be dog bite, it could be lacerated on metal, wood, um, different things. And then the final one that I'll talk about is the tertiary or delayed primary closure. And this is basically when we have a, a defect that could be closed, there's enough skin to close it, but because of fear of infection, we don't want to close it yet because if we closed it up and there's infection in there and there's no place for it to drain, that's when we get these big nasty abscesses that can leak out. Uh, and we definitely don't want that to happen. Let me see if I can pin my video. Okay, can y'all see me? Yep. Okay. Um, Sometimes I like to talk with my hands, so I don't know if that'll be helpful or not. But um, okay. so with the wound left open, uh, that gives us some time to uh, allow that to drain out so that we don't get those big nasty abscesses. Um, and typically, um, this is going to be, you know, we're going to wait probably two to three days, sometimes four days, and just kind of give it the skin a chance to declare itself. And what I mean by declare itself is uh, over time, that skin that doesn't have good blood flow is going to start to kind of change colors. It's going to be more of a brown or have bad smell or just look unhealthy. And those are the tissues that you're going to want to debride prior to closing. And again, one of the most common examples is going to be a dog bite wound. Um, that again, maybe they, it's kind of a shearing effect where it just peeled back the skin and there's enough that we could close it down and suture that together. But we don't want to do that just yet because dog bites are known to be high contamination. And so we don't want to close it up again, risking for infection. So when we see a new wound, I think it's nice to have kind of a checklist that you go through um, to knock, you know, just to make sure you're covering your bases. So the first one that we'll talk about is just assessing the situation, uh, assessing the wound and the, and the patient at that time. Um, then we want to clip it, um, any hair that's around there, if we have clippers available, we want to clip it up really good and clean it and lavage it out. Um, then we need to decide, okay, do we need to close this one at this time or do we need to give it some time to, to, glare, to declare itself? Um, after that, we need to decide on antibiotics, which, which ones do we need to do, how long we need to do them, um, followed by pain medicine. Does this animal seem painful? Does it need pain meds? Depending on how severe, what pain medicine should we choose? Um, and then we'll go through the different topical therapies on when to use which ones and how long, uh, as well as bandage. You know, do we need to bandage it? Will it be okay to be left open? So the first thing that I, I want to talk about was um, just assessing the situation. So we have this dog that comes in, and you know, and this is a really, you know, it looks like a very dramatic uh, wound, and it is. Um, but I think it's important to remember. I think that it's important to remember um, to look at the whole patient. So if we focus in on this because it's dripping a little bit of blood, uh, and maybe this dog got hit by a car, maybe it got attacked um, by, by an animal, whatever, it's important to do a full physical exam because a lot of times what can happen is we'll get distracted with this one particular injury and maybe the dog's having trouble breathing and we don't really pick up on it because we're so focused on this or maybe this, this dog has got a penetration into his abdomen um, 
or maybe he has a broken bone somewhere, but because we're so focused on this one injury, uh, we can miss that. Um, I think it's, you know, if we're going to have to move this animal, especially if we're out in a rural environment and maybe we need to move this animal uh, over to a little bit cleaner area, or maybe we need to put him in a, a spot before we can sedate him a little bit later. Uh, I think it's good to go ahead and, and flush it out some with some water and uh, some saline, but then we need to cover it so it will minimize additional bacteria and uh, contaminants from getting in there. I think it's good then to, to clean up the wound. So we want to first clip up around the wound. I really like uh, putting sterile lube if you have that available. I like to coat that thing in, in sterile lube. And basically what that does is it keeps a nice protective layer. And so when you're clipping that hair, all that hair that's going everywhere is not going to go directly into the wound. It's going to be stuck on the, the sterile lube. And then once you put the sterile lube on there, you can either wrap it at that point and come back to it later, or you can then clip it up and, and clean it up. So the next thing that we'll do is, um, is start cleaning it. And one thing that we say all the time in the U.S., or at least our vet school did, and a lot of veterinarians I know, is the solution to pollution is dilution. And essentially what that means is the more pollution that you have, the more bacteria, the more dirt and grime and, and, and uh, crust and everything, is the more fluids and cleaning that you need to perform. The first thing that you can do if it's a really big, just nasty, uh, contaminated wound is just use regular tap water. If you have a water hose, um, you can just kind of uh, lightly put some of that on there to kind of knock out the big obvious contaminants. And then once you've done that, I do like to use sterile saline. Um, the pressure of the saline that you use on the wound is really beneficial too, um, because what that can do is help blow out the bacteria that have these adhesive properties where they can actually bind to the tissues. So if you can hook that up to a fluid set uh, with like an IV line and either compress the IV bag with your hands or if you have access to one of these, um, these fluid pump pressure bags and increase that to about 300 millimeters of mercury, that, can, um, that sets it at about the right pound per square inch uh, pressure that can go in there and kind of blow out that bacteria. But at the same time, you don't want to get too high of pressure to hurt the underlying tissue. But usually if you get an 18 gauge needle with a fluid sac or a fluid bag, or if you have like access to a 35 um, uh, ml syringe and you can just draw up your fluid and, and, and compress that into the, the wound as well. After we lavage it, I like to use some dilute chlorhexidine or um, iodine. And uh, so Dr. Paul, is this the, the uh, Savlon y'all were talking about? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so, and, and this is chlorhexidine. So if you have access to this, this I think would be great. I would mix this with some saline first or some water first. I wouldn't just do straight out of the bottle, but mix that with some saline or some water, take some gauzes and just scrub um, the wound really good uh, for about five minutes or so. Um, after that, that's when we need to decide if we should, if we needed to bride the, the bride it at this point or not. Uh, a lot of times, um, debriding just means to remove the dead and necrotic tissue around the wound. Um, a lot of times you're going to have to sedate the animal for this, or you might can use some local lidocaine blocks um, before doing this, but this will help the body kind of get rid of that necrotic tissue and, and freshen up the edges. What I mean by that is you take like a number 10 blade. And so if you got your wound here, you're going to just kind of go side to side, roughing up that edge until you get some nice healthy bleeding tissue, because at that point we know that's healthy tissue and that can allow for continual uh, influx of good cells and, and growth factors and, and stimulation to help heal that wound. So any discolored area, you want to do it. And, and typically day, <clears throat> excuse me, typically day one, you want to do that and then come back in three to five days um, and do it again, potentially, depending on the severity of that wound. So 
we can look at this wound here. Just a second. Um, and so this wound here, you can see quite a bit of contamination. Can y'all see my cursor? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. Um, so this right here, this almost looks like maybe a maggot is in here. We've got all this uh, nasty black tissue, uh, quite a bit of bruising here. Um, so my best get, you know, this looks like probably got a, a, a dog bite, but even if it wasn't a dog bite, this is a lot of contaminant. So first thing that you could do if you're out in the field, if you're um, in a village working, is just take some water, like I said, and wash off all this big, big stuff. This one's already been clipped up, but, you know, clipping all this hair and getting that out of the way. And then we would go through and take out any of this kind of necrotic dead tissue um, and remove it. And then once we, you know, we could scrub it up before that and then kind of remove all this dead necrotic tissue. And then this would be one that we wouldn't want to just close immediately. So even if we could take this edge and suture it to this edge, we wouldn't necessarily want to do that because again, we could have a lot of um, contaminant that still stays behind even after all the cleaning up. So um, we might could do a partial closure, um, but we definitely would want to put some drains in here, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. Um, but this would be one that um, is pretty, pretty typical for a severe to moderate to severe dog fight wound. So with dog fight wounds, I do want to mention that kind of specifically. Um, and I like to talk about the iceberg effect. And so right here, you know, we've got this little patch of ice out in the lake that seems like, okay, that's not big of a deal. Um, but with an iceberg, you know, 80 to 90% of the mass is under the water. And so with these dog bites, it can be a little puncture wound, but that little puncture wound can do a significant amount of damage. Um, so one like this right here, you know, it doesn't look that severe. It's just one little bitty. You can see that compared to the fingers, it's pretty small. But that one little wound, um, if that's in the right place, can cause a lot of damage, especially if it's over the thorax or the abdomen where we have, you know, bacteria that's released into the abdomen or the thorax. You're, now you're talking about a serious situation at that point. And even if it's not over that area, um, dog bites, they typically, what they do is they're going to come down, they're going to clamp. And when they clamp, their teeth are going to come in at an angle. And when it comes into that angle and they pull up from after biting down, is they're going to separate the layers of like muscle layer from sub-Q to skin. And so you're going to have all this dead space, which is a perfect location for um, bacteria to set up shop and cause an abscess. So even if it doesn't look that severe with dog bites, you got to be really careful. Um, and so let's go back to our checklist. First thing we're going to do is assess the situation. If that penetration or if that bite wound is near the thorax, we want to watch their breathing. Are they having trouble breathing? Is it rapid? Um, make sure that we don't have penetration into the chest. Uh, then we're going to clip it up and clip up the whole area because a lot of times we'll miss a lot of the bruising and the excessive necrotic or potentially necrotic issues because of the, when they crush down, they'll cut off the blood supply to that area. And it may not be evident within the first day or so. And so it's important to let the owner know to be watching that area very closely because that skin around it potentially could die off. Then we want to explore those wounds. And again, it, it depends on the situation. If you're able to sedate them, that's great. And take like a sterile hemostat. And you basically can kind of go in at different angles trying to figure out how deep is it? Does it connect into a different cavity? Um, is there enough dead space or enough separation that you need to put a drain in? Because like I said, even small surface wounds can hide significant damage. One other thing to be aware of with significant uh, dog fights um, is they can lead to sears, which is severe inflammatory response syndrome. Essentially what that is, is when you have such a severe tissue trauma that it is collecting a ton of those neutrophils and macrophages and other white blood cells that are releasing these cytokines and attracting all of these different um, interleukin and inflammatory response. Well, at first, it's just in that one little defect. But if the body feels like that's not enough or it's being overwhelmed, it'll start releasing those throughout the entire body. And when that happens, we have, basically we start to roll into a shock-like 
um, or they basically are in shock at that point. And so their blood pressure is going to drop. Their fluids are all going to leak out of the intravascular space into the extravascular space. And what we would be looking for is tachycardia. We can see hypovolemia, uh, low blood pressure. Um, a lot of times they'll spike a fever or have an increase in their, in their temperature. And so if we don't jump on these things quickly and get them cleaned up quickly and help this dog out with medications and drains and that kind of thing, it can lead to a very serious condition quickly. And like I said, I mentioned the, the, the chest and abdominal wounds. I don't have enough time, don't to, have enough time to, to dive into to dive in going in and doing like an exploratory and, and flushing out the abdomen and putting in drains. But that's typically what has to be done for those really uh, nasty wounds because you can lead to peritonitis and uh, pneumothorax, which um, a lot of times if they, I will make this quick thing. If they're having trouble breathing um, and it's over the chest, a lot of times once you flush it out, if you'll take some sterile lube and then you can wrap that with some um, like saran wrap or some clear uh, airproof wrap. And essentially you just plug in that wound so that they don't um, continue to have like a one way valve where they're having trouble getting air in and out because of that one wound. So you can wrap that with some sterile lube um, as a quick fix until you can get them uh, into a more stable environment. Just be careful of, again, of like a, a tension pneumothorax, which is when they're sucking air into through that one valve, but then they can't get it back out. And so the air fills up around their lungs. And if that's the case, you might actually have to drain the air off their chest. Um, like I said, I'm a big fan of, of drains for just w wounds in general. If there's any um, significant dead space, just go ahead and put a drain in there. Um, like I'm a big fan of like the Penrose drain, which you'll see in this next picture here. Um, you can see this is a Penrose drain, which is just a standard passive drain. Anytime you've got significant uh, dead space, I, I really like using these. And I usually leave them in for three to five days and take them out. Uh, and really, you can if you can't if you're in, again if you're in a camp situation or a village situation, you can show the owner how to to just take out. Usually, I'll just put one big suture here and one big suture at the end of it, and so you can just have the owners remove that in three to five days just by snipping those out. Um, you can see the severe bruising here, um, and again, this is a, a dog attack uh, attacking a little bit smaller dog. This severe bruising, there's a good chance in three to five days, all this may slough off and die. So it's just good to be aware of that. So that you can tell the owner that that's a possibility. Um, and then it's also good to recheck. So if you're in a more of a clinic setting, it's good to recheck this dog in three to five days. Check on your drains, remove them if you need to. Otherwise, um, there's a chance, you know, just to keep a close eye on that. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, or as we continue down our list, you know, once we've decided that, okay, we got it clipped up, we got it cleaned up, the dog is stable, then we need to decide, okay, do we need to close this or not? And really it's, a, it's gonna be case by case. It just really depends, um, you know, what caused the wound is one of the biggest things to find out because if it's a dog bite, 95% of the time, you're not gonna wanna close it, at least not all the way uh, without putting a drain in. Um, but a lot of times you're going to leave, want to leave those open, especially if they're like a little dog tooth penetration, kind of like that first picture I showed. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> let me go back to that last picture. So this one right here, you're not going to want to necessarily close this one all the time because um, if it goes penetrates down a couple inches and injects all that bacteria, that's a perfect place for an abscess. And the only place that that thing can drain out of is that little hole that's left. So if we close that little hole up, um, now we just created an abscess. So if it's, you know, if it's relatively a clean surface, so if it's like just some glass or metal, then we might could get away with um, clipping it up flushing it out really good and closing it, or maybe we just leave the very distal or caudal end or ventral end open, just to allow a little bit of drainage. Um, how long has it been open is also important to know. So like this wound in particular, the owners tried to close it themselves with this big Band-Aid, which I don't think quite is enough to handle that big of a wound. Um, 
but as you can see here, we actually have already got some granulation tissue happening deep, deeper in here. And so we could flush this one out and maybe do a partial closure, recheck it in three to five days, and then do um, finish up closing that wound. So it's gonna probably need some help to close. Eventually it would, would fill in all the way, but I think a partial closure here would be just fine. Uh, do we need a drain? Um, depends on the, again, on the situation, but if you're on the fence of doing a drain and it's pretty feasible with the uh, environment they in, I would recommend go ahead and just put the drain in. Um, and then again, freshen up those edges. If you can say that sedate the dog or if it's a tough, uh, pretty stoic dog, or if you can use lidocaine to, to numb the edges, then um, you can divide that and uh, freshen up those edges. And the last thing we need to talk about in a minute is going to be the, the bandage types. So for antibiotic choices, um, in general, for most of your wounds, just a good um, broad spectrum antibiotic like amoxiclav, nine times out of 10 is gonna be just fine. If it's been going on and you can tell there's a lot of infection, especially deep infection, that's when you wanna go with some more of your combinations. Amoxiclav and enterofloxacin is a really good combination. If it is a do dog bite wound and you're worried about a deeper abscess, adding in metronidazole can be really beneficial with the antibiotic, I mean, sorry, the anaerobic coverage that that offers. Uh, Dr. Paul said that y'all had access to chlorophenicol too, which is a great antibiotic. You just got to be really careful with that um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we do want to try to minimize antibiotic resistance, so we don't want to throw chlorophenicol at every little routine wound. Uh, and the other big thing is that you got to be careful when you prescribe that to your clients or to the uh, different owners because it can have um, detrimental results in human, humans that come in contact with it. It can cause aplastic anemia, and so, uh, which can be fatal. And so it's really important that when we do prescribe it that we really warn those owners. They need to be wearing gloves when they're handling it, uh, washing their hands really good after giving it to their, to their animal. Uh, but it is, like I said, it's a very good antibiotic. So if you try the moxiclav and the interofloxacin with maybe Metro and you're not getting any improvement at all, that's when you might can add in the chlorophenicol at that point. All right, so uh, pain medications. Uh, one that I do like to use quite a bit is gabapentin. I don't think it's, you know, if you have a really traumatic wound and the animal is clearly really painful. I don't like using gabapentin by itself, um, but it's a good add-on. It is a GABA agonist, and so it's going to downregulate the pain response. It's going to help more with kind of the nerve, the nerve pain. I typically like to start at about 10 milligrams per kilogram. It's a really safe drug in general. Uh, at least I have found it to be a really safe drug. I've used it. Um, I use it almost daily. I use it for surgical. Um, procedures. I use it for wound management. Um, I use it as an add-on for osteoarthritis. It's just a really good all-around medication. Um, I typically give it every 8 to 12 hours. You know, if it's a little bit more severe, every 8 hours. Otherwise, every 12 to 24 is okay. Um, biggest side effects that I see with it are going to be um, some drowsiness and uh, sedation. But again, I, I don't typically worry too much about um, side effects unless they have uh, other medications on board like other seizure medications because it is used to control like mild um, seizures. Um, not a great first round, again not great for managing seizures by itself but it has been used in the past for that so but kind of recently in the last probably five years or so there's been a lot more people going to gabapentin because of the more research on tramadol saying it's not as effective as we once thought. One thing to remember and be careful is if you order the liquid kind, because most of the time gabapentin yeah, comes in 100, 300, 400 milligram capsules or, or you can get tablets too, but the suspension is nice for your smaller dogs and uh, cats, but you need to be careful on where you get that through because there are some that contain xylitol uh, which can be, you know, toxic to the liver as well as the sugar levels. So just be really careful that you read up on that before you order liquid. The other 
Um, big classification is opioids, especially, you know, for like the first time, if you're going to sedate them, it's always good to put, if it's a big wound, put an opioid on board. I like hydromorphone or morphine. I think both of those work really well, especially, you know, in combination with dexmedetomidine or acepromazine, just to get and give them some good sedation before uh, debriding it and cleaning it up. Like I said, I think tramadol has come under a lot of scrutiny in the last probably five to 10 years on its actual efficacy on how well it works for pain. Most people are saying now that it just doesn't really help with pain much at all with dogs, but I think it can help with sedation and, and maybe just kind of help keep them calm. So if you've got a, you've got a really big incision that you want the animal to stay calm at home, I think tramadol can help with that, you know, just kind of keeping them relaxed and at ease. It is an opioid though, so I don't know what, it depends on the country or state that you're in on how much control they have over your opioids. So that's another downside to opioids is it is a controlled drug, at least in the U.S. And so you might have a little bit more regulatory stuff you have to keep up with that one. And that's why I like gabapentin is currently it's not controlled, at least not in North Carolina. There's a few states in America that they're starting to put it under control. So might want to just watch out for that. But for now, it's, it's not, um, depending on the location. Um, but probably the number one drug overall that I like to use just for great pain medicine um, and anti-inflammatory control is a good NSAID. So carprofen or Remedil, Prevacox, any of those, it's just really, really good for, <clears throat> excuse me, good for minor wounds and, and minor trauma. The one caveat would be if you've got a really nasty wound or a really nasty dog attack uh, patient that you're worried may be going or tipping into a shocky um, or a systemic inflammatory response, I would not use NSAID in that situation. And the reason for that is you're going to have poor perfusion to your organs, especially your, um, your kidneys. And so that can cause additional damage um, to your kidneys and potentially your liver. So just be really careful if you have a very severe um, attack, uh, dog attack, or any trauma that could potentially cause uh, an inflammatory response there. All right. So topical therapy, this one to me is a really... Um, Really big, sorry, I keep cutting it out. Um, topical theory, therapy is, is a really, is one that I really like because it's one, it's really inexpensive. A few of them that I use is very expen inexpensive. Uh, it's easy to, to use and it's very natural and it's highly effective. Uh, number one is honey, um, which some people, you know, have never really used honey before, but man, I am such a big fan of it. I really like it. Now they make actual, um, medical grade honey called Manuka honey and it's based out of New Zealand it has a, a little bit um, it's, like I said you can find it online and order it and it's been shown to be a little bit more effective than raw honey but I typically just use raw honey um, I do think it's important to use raw honey over manufactured honey if possible um, and uh, the nice thing about honey is it has antioxidant anti-inflammatory and antibacterial effects it actually um, has a low um, pH, and so it's very acidic, and so it can kill bacteria. So that means it has the sugar in it has a high osmolality or a high osmotic effect, and so it can kill bacteria through that way. It also helps with pulling fluid out of the skin, so it can help with edema or uh, inflammation. Um, and so I really like honey as a, as a topical therapy. And then another one is just good old granulated sugar also. And so it's very similar in the way that it works with honey is that it has it inhibits the bacterial growth, um, reduces swelling just like uh, honey does. Um, uh, one other thing about honey is it also has some hydrogen peroxide, uh, releases a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. And so it's just uh, overall just a really good antiseptic. Uh, and then granulated sugar, the other nice thing with honey and sugar is like, hey, if you get hungry, you know, it's pretty tasty. You can uh, put it in your, your cup of coffee, your cup of to tokai, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, but you can load that up with some sugar after you're done clipping up and finishing up your wound. 
a couple other products um, is the uh, is it like the triple antibiotic or the antibiotic with maybe a little bit of steroid. I think these are fine to use too, um, especially in the more minor wounds. Um, if you got like something that's maybe oozing, the owner, you know, is worried because it's oozing a little bit of blood or a little bit of discharge. You can actually pack the incision or the wound with a little bit of this to kind of help stop the bleeding if it's just mild. Um, but I think this can be beneficial. Um, Dr. Paul also mentioned this fly spray, and I wouldn't want to spray this directly on a wound, um, but I think it can be beneficial like around a wound if the dog's going to be outside, um, lives outside, or if it's kind of a stray dog or something like that. I think putting it on the outside, I just don't like to spray it directly in the wound. One thing I do like to mention is I don't like to use hydrogen peroxide over and over and over again because of its caustic nature. It actually can slow um, angiogenesis or the development of new blood vessels in that area. And so if you want to use it the first time just as a uh, to get some of that debris out of there, I think that's okay. Same thing with alcohol. If you want to do that like the first time, but I don't like to use that repeatedly because I think it can it will damage uh, new cell growth and it can slow. Uh, that wound closure. Um, I'm going to talk about bandaging real quick. So the most common bandage is wet to dry bandage. And the primary layer is typically one of the most important and that's where you're going to use your honey um, or your sugar. And this is going to be more for your extremities. So you can see here they've already wrapped up this leg and then all of this powder is actually sugar. Now this is a little excessive uh, but you do want to coat it really well and then you can take like a lap sponge or a gauze or, and then kind of soak this and wrap it around in some sterile saline. And then you can use some of this bandage material like cast padding um, that's really absorbent, uh, followed by vet wrap to kind of help support it all. And that cast padding will kind of absorb all of that. For the first few days though, it's important to change this bandage out uh, daily just because it's gonna be so um, so much fluid that's going to be coming out. I think it's important to, to change that out daily. Uh, and the other one that I really like using is the tie over bandage. This one is really nice when you have a big defect that um, can't be wrapped easily. So like over the hip like this one is here or um, it's too too much tension. And so the, the way that we do this is you uh, you can see these little belt loop sutures and I have some better pictures in a minute that go all the way around the incision or the wound then you're going to pack that thing full of sugar or honey and then you can put your your um, wet gauzes in there followed by some nice cast padding to absorb everything and then I like to put some kind of piece of plastic it could be you know um, plastic bag or from a a drape pack or something like that. And then I use umbilical tape most of the time. And you're just gonna kinda do the zigzag pattern all the way through different directions and then tie that up. And that's gonna keep that skin, it's gonna roll that skin over. So it's gonna reduce tension on that wound. It's gonna stretch your skin out uh, and also keep that nice and clean. Uh, it is important to use really big sutures and you wanna stay about two centimeters away from the, the wound edge. Um, and then use non-absorbable or PDS would be fine too. All right, and then this one you also wanna change out once a day to every two days until you get some nice granulation tissue in there. So let's go, we're getting close to our time here. So let's run through a case real quick. So I had um, a dog that came in. We have a traveling surgeon that comes in and does all of our TPLOs. So she performed the surgery in our clinic and about a week after the owner called us and said, hey, our, our pup got his e-collar off and he's been licking the incision a lot. So you can see here, uh, we got some, some uh, unhealthy white tissue here. It's really red and irritated. It should by this point be nice and just coming together right here, but you can see we're starting to have some opening. So we put him on antibiotics. We um, flushed it out a little bit. And two days later, um, it wasn't doing any better. So we sedated him and um, we flushed it all out, freshened up all these edges. That's why it's kind of bloody as we, we uh, took a blade and freshened up all these edges. Uh, and then four days later, came back and decided that we needed to, we can start to see here is actually the bone plate that was put in. And you can see it right here. 
And so since we saw that bone plate, we started getting worried that maybe that was gonna get infected. So we um, sedated them again, cleaned up the edges, freshened them up and put in these belt loop sutures again for our tie over bandage. And you can see two days later, um, here's the plate. It's nice and shiny after we cleaned it up. And we, we started the tie over bandage on day 14 post-op, continued it. Day 17, you can see uh, this is starting to close down just a little bit. And what we did on day 17 is I took this edge here. Now that it looked nice and healthy in here, I didn't see any signs of bacteria or infection. So I took this edge and actually sutured it down to this granulation tissue. Um, and then three days later, we came back and you can see it's already nice and starting to come together here. We left just a little piece open just in case anything else needed to drain out just to be safe. Uh, and at this point on this one, this is where we're gonna pour honey and sugar into, and then we're gonna put some gauze over it and kind of jam it up under the skin best we can. And this is gonna be changed every, um, you know, two to one to two days uh, to three days at most. And then here we've got this closed up. We left the tie over bandage on just to be safe. Uh, here's the next day. Um, and we ended up leaving this, the sutures in just in case it opened up again, but we didn't uh, use a tie over at this point. But you can see we got some nice scabbing happening here. And then this is day 24 after we took out the belt loop sutures. Um, and it ended up healing up from that point on really nicely. So, you know, when you start out at such a nasty spot, it's like, oh my gosh, is this ever gonna heal up? But if you stay diligent with it and keep them clean, keep them on good antibiotics, um, you, can, you can get there. And then one more last one here. So we lavaged it, we used chlorhex, sedated it multiple times, um, we used a tie over. We ended up using chloramphenicol and interafloxacin on this guy because we did do a culture. Uh, and we use carprofen. And then our last one here is um, we had a cat come in that was attacked by, we think a dog, but you can see it had maggots in this area here, probably about 50 to 60 maggots uh, that we had to end up removing. Now, once I sedated the cat, I took out all this necrotic tissue. I put a drain in here and here. And then you can see my belt loop sutures. Um, and I arguably could have put in a few more um, and then nine days after we, we did that, you can see we have a nice bed of, of tissue, granulation tissue. Uh, and then we have a little bit of a gap here, uh, but a nice bed of granulation tissues. The owners were changing this out daily at home, putting in honey and then changing out the gauze. 16 days after that, you can see this is contracting down, um, closing out that hole. And then this is two months afterwards. You can see um, this is almost completely healed and this is going to be Within about another month after that, it was um, completely healed. Uh, so we took out the maggots, sedated, did the Penrose drain. We did a daily change at home. And every couple of weeks, we brought them in because they were trying to um, be careful with finances there. Uh, and we used um, an NSAID and gabapentin and the injectable uh, antibiotic convenia. Uh, one small thing is if, it, if we do have a cat attacking another cat, you might want to consider doing FIV, FELV testing just to make sure nothing was transmitted. Um, so just to summarize, uh, the number one thing, again, is assess the situation. Make sure they're breathing okay. Make sure there's no broken bones or nothing else going on. You want to clean it really well. You want to clip around it if you have access to clippers. Uh, make sure that you're not underestimating a dog bite. And remember the, the iceberg effect. You decide if you want to clean it. Uh, clean it up and close it then, or maybe leave it open for a few days and let it declare itself, remove any of the necrotic tissue you need to, and then you can come back and close it. Um, your antibiotics, don't forget pain medicine, um, topical therapy, like we said, we talked about the honey and the sugar and the um, different topical triple antibiotic ointments, and then the different types of bandaging. All right, so that's pretty much what I've got. Sorry for rushing it there at the end, but I just wanted to respect y'all's time to finish up. Um, this is the email that you can use if you have any questions, um, you can send them there and they'll be forwarded to me. So now I'm ready to take on any questions y'all have. Hey, thank you, Dr. Mark, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.
Thank you. I am sure that everybody could have, you know, I don't think any veterinarian who has not come across a wound. So it's so amazing that, you know, you are able to kind of uh, uh, put everything in a very systematic way. We are all able to understand that. And uh, now this is a time, and uh, some disturbance are there, I don't know. This is a time for questions. And uh, I encourage you uh, to unmute yourself and then ask question directly to Dr. Mark. Uh, if you don't want to ask him directly, you can put it your uh, questions in the chat box where Dr. Mark can see that and then you know you'll be able to answer. Okay, there's one question is there. How about tetanus infection in small animals? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so <clears throat> with botulism um, in particular, uh, we don't, I mean, it definitely happens in small animals. I don't see, uh, and Dr. Page may can comment on this too. I don't see a ton of botulism. Uh, but once we have tetanus infections, that can be pretty nasty uh, to deal with because, you know, with the muscle rigidity that happens, a lot of times what I like to do is try to keep them as, as calm and sedate as you can because if they overwork themselves, once they, once they realize that they're, they can't really use their muscles like they want to, they can kind of, for lack of a better word, freak out, and then they can drive up their temperature really bad. Um, so it's important to keep them as calm as you can. Again, kind of assess the situation on how they present. You want to flush it out really well um, and clean it up really well. And then a good antibiotic to, to cover the botulism toxicity and or cover the botulism. Dr. Page, do you have anything else to add to that? I can say that the, the only tetanus kind of stuff I've ever seen were in dogs that were young, had a bite wound or a wound of some sort that wasn't treated and were, they came in like two or three weeks later with it. So that's the only cases I've ever seen with it. Yeah, I haven't, like I said, I honestly have not seen that many cases. I had one in particular in vet school. Uh, it was the same thing. It was a young pup, little husky puppy. And at that point he had um, full on muscle rigidity. He ended up being hospitalized for like two weeks and he was on constantly on um, an opioid in uh, CRI. He was on uh, dexmedetomidine it was not a, an easy or a simple case. I mean, this was like a, a two to three week process all within the hospital. Um, and so, yeah, ideally if we can, if we can clean up those wounds as soon as possible. And, and that's what I was talking about kind of going back to the, you know, systemic inflammation uh, response or shock response that still can happen when they immediately when they get attacked, but the quicker you can get to them, the quicker you can get them cleaned up and, and get them flushed out, the lower chance you'll see uh, with the tetanus. Okay, thank you. I think Srinish is happy with this answer. Anybody wants to ask any more? You can unmute yourself. You can ask directly to Dr. Mark, who is available here. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, the other day we had a snake bite, and it was a wiper bite, and the bite was on the tongue. So, of course, we had all the antivenoms and all those things were done, but then I was a little... I was wondering, like, what would have been the best uh, best method to handle the wounds of the tongue, especially when they're snake bites? You said on the tongue? Yes, on the tongue. Ouch. Um, so, you know, a lot of times with snake bites, um, it's kind of the same thing. We, we kind of like, we want to flush them out, clean them up really good, but we also want to kind of let them declare themselves. If you have, if it's a poisonous snake, Obviously, and if you have access to antivenom, that's great. Uh, that's a great place to start. Um, again, and, or with snake bites, it's, it's important to, um, for the analgesic side, so the pain medicine, you want to make sure they're under good pain control. Um, if it's a snake that's associated with contamination consistently, that's when you want to add in your antibiotics. Um, a lot of times we don't do... Um, well, I guess it depends on where you're at. Like academia in the U.S., they don't really like antibiotics for snake bites. But in general practice, a lot of times we do antibiotics for snake bites because we see a lot of um, copperheads in this area. 
and they can cause a lot of necrosis and, and devitalized tissue when they bite. Um, steroids are controversial on if you should use those or not. Again, kind of when you get to the, the research academia side, they're going to kind of stay away from them. But if you get into a point to where it's just the swelling is ridiculous and, and there's nothing else you can do, it's one of those things where at, the, at that point you might want to just um, consider it just to see if you can help with the swelling. Uh, but I don't usually start with steroids um, at that point. Antivenom is number one. Pain medicine is really important. Flushing it out, cleaning it up, and just having the owners check it. And sometimes if it's not the – the tongue would be hard, but a lot of times we'll take a permanent marker and mark the skin – to see how bad the swelling is getting. So like day one, we'll mark the skin, day, day two, so we can kind of track it and see where it's heading. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I mean, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. Dr. Eliezer, Hello. please carry on. Uh, yeah. uh, it's me, Eliza. Um, Actually, Dr. Mark, uh, I want to ask you like, uh, for, um, these uh, dog dog bite wounds. Uh, you're saying you use honey, right? Yes. Like you use it uh, simultaneously with uh, antibiotic ointments or just honey itself? Uh, a lot of times, just honey itself. So um, again, once it's all flushed out and cleaned up, um, that's when I'll I'll take the honey, and you can use quite a bit of it. Um, granulated sugar is a little less messy than honey, but I think that with the honey, you get a little bit more effect. So it, it, it's kind of a, if you're okay with dealing with the mess, that's what I, I like to use honey first. And you can kind of um, just kind of lather it on the, on the wound. And then, like I said, after that point, that's when you can kind of pack in your sterile saline soaked gauzes on top of that, and then do your tie over bad uh, bandage. Um, but yeah, a lot of times I'll just use honey. The ointments, I usually save those for more mild stuff. That's maybe um, just like I said, like something that doesn't really need um, suturing at any point, um, like a little cut and scrapes and things like that's when I use it. Or like I said, if there's like something that's a little bit of oozing, um, I think those are more beneficial at that point. Uh, so one more question from the chat box. What about suturing dog bite wounds in birds? Uh, so what about, uh, I would, I don't, I honestly don't deal with poultry very often, but I, I think that it would be pretty much the same scenario where you're just going to flush them out really well, clean them up, kind of let them declare themselves. Because it, I don't think it it <clears throat> matters depending on the animal as much because if you leave bacteria down there and you suture it up, you're going to get an abscess. So I think it's it's important to to leave it open, let it drain on its own. You know, it's it's really amazing what these animals can heal from. Uh, if we just give them some, you know, clean out the worst of it, get rid of that necrotic dead tissue, uh, a lot of times these animals can um, can recover from that and just let the, the wound granulate in and, and recover. Yeah, one more question is there in the chat box from yeah, Dr. That's, Jeremy. Are you able a, to see that, Mark? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question. And, and what he asked was, um, is ear bandaging um, in dogs? And this one can be really challenging at times because, you know, the ear, it's one, it's really hard just to get to stop bleeding sometimes. Um, and if it's multiple wounds, those things can be really hard to wrap and, and to keep wrapped. But a lot of times what we'll use is a technique where you basically, so that this is, let's say I have a dog ear here. So we're going to wrap around the ear and then sometimes we'll actually come over the top and then wrap loosely around the neck and you gotta be really careful not to put too much pressure on the throat and the neck uh, but we'll, a lot of times we'll wrap it to the top of the head um, because the more that those wounds on those ears what the dogs tend to like to do is shake their head a lot and keep them flapping and what they'll do is they'll shoot off those blood clots and then they'll start bleeding and oozing again it can take a lot longer to heal up so a lot of times we'll wrap them and then either secure them to the top of the head um, and if you can't keep a wound, if it, like you just cannot get it to heal and you can't keep it on top of the head because of the uh, wound keeps slipping, um, you can actually, this sounds kind of um, mean, but you can actually suture a couple of sutures to the top of the 
the uh, ear to the top of the head to kind of keep it in place for a week or so, and then come back and take those sutures out after the wounds kind of healed up. It's really very challenging thing to keep the ear bandage in, intact. The moment it shakes, everything falls apart. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that can be really challenging. And like I said, if, if you get into a position where you just cannot, and that's, so ears are actually one place I do like to use ointments because again, it can kind of help plug those wounds up and kind of help, help reduce some of that oozing. So that's a good place for your ointments. Um, and like I said, in the most severe cases, if you cannot get them to keep their head still, you can either suture the ear directly to the um, top of the head, or if it needs a drain, like if you have uh, recurrent hematomas and you need to uh, put a drain in or do a, um, a repair, you can actually suture the drain to the top of the head or just like I said, just the, the tip of the ear. So um, I have another person here asking, is sugar and honey more effective than iodine for bandaging wounds? I would say yes. I think I think iodine and chlorohex are a good place to start with your when you're doing your lavage and you're cleaning it out really well. But I like sugar and honey um, because you can pack that in there and that has like a continual effect while it's there and it's helping stimulate the the growth factors and stimulate the wound healing. Now, one caveat is with dry wounds, you want to be really careful. So with dry wounds, you don't want to necessarily use honey and sugar because it's going to, if you have a dry wound, that osmotic effect from the sugar and the honey is going to pull out the little bit of fluid that's, that's left there. So you don't, you want to try to minimize sugar and honey for dry wounds. And that's when you want to use more of your ointments and creams. Um, but in general, I like to use basically a combination of two. So when you're rechecking that dog, I like to use iodine um, and LRS scrub it up, clean it up really good. And then when you're about to put your bandage on, that's when I like to put my granulated sugar or honey. Sorry, but I have another question for... Carry on, Dr. Lisa. Uh, yeah, I was about, I'm, I'm trying to ask like, um, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Lee, what, 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 would we, would you, uh, what would your be, would your approach be for hematomas, especially I've encountered uh, many dogs and usually dogs with a small hematoma on the lateral uh, thoracic region. So the, um, so how would you approach, approach that? It's, uh, hematomas in general. Hematoma on the ear or hematoma? Oh, on the body. I've the body. encountered like on the, lat yeah, on the, on the la lateral thoracic region, usually. Like after a bite wound? Dog bite. Yeah, maybe like maybe a bite wound which have, we didn't really puncture the skin, but just caused blunt trauma. Oh, okay, thing. I got you. So a um, couple of different things that you can do. Um, if you don't think there's any infection present and it's just a hematoma, sometimes the, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes the body can reabsorb it. But if your strong suspicion it's a dog bite, that might be a crushing injury issue. And so that hematoma is a great bed for bacteria to grow in. And so you might want to consider um, opening up that ear. I mean, sorry, opening up that hematoma. And that might be a place where you need to put a drain in depending on the size of the hematoma. If it's really small and you're not too worried about it, you might can just kind of monitor it. Sometimes you can drain them, but it might fill back in. Um, but if you're worried about it being a dog bite and maybe again, that crushing force that kills or devitalizes the tissue under there, um, you might consider opening that up and putting a drain in. Thank you. Well, one more question is there. Um, so how to, deal, how to deal with maggots infected in the ear wound. So um, if they're, you know, visible and you can get them out, then I would just, you know, remove any of them that are there. If they're down in the ear, that is a little bit more challenging. Um, I would think that you might could fill the ear up with, I'll ask Dr. Page this, I would think you could fill up the ear with some kind of um, saline or LRS and kind of drown them out. Yeah, you can do that. And if you have access to Capstar, actually, Capstar will kill any maggots too. Okay, well, that's great to know too. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yep. So I Capstar. In India, and I just put a word forward for that, uh, those maggot wounds in India, we have a preparation called God Pack Powder. It, uh, it is for of Beefer, Beefer, the company Beefer. 
and that's very good for maggots. So we can pack the ear. It's not painful. Oh, you can great. pack the ear with, uh, uh, with that powder. It's called got back, G-O-T-B-A-C. Cool. Great. What about turpentine oil? It's not good, huh? You know, can we use, can we use ivermectin? I don't think ivermectin works for that. For I've never used. Pardon? Yeah, I've never used ivermectin for. We can, for we can use ivermectin. If you, you put ivermectin, all the worms will come up. Within six oh, direct, hours or directly on them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ivermectin is good for everything, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Even for COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Right. There was articles in the U.S. that, that uh, ivermectin was going to cure COVID. Oh. So everybody was buying oh. that up and we couldn't find any anywhere. <laughs> <laughs>